so we are going to dive right in today because there's a lot to cover. And just for any of you that are new to the format, uh, master classes are very similar to our in conversation with in the fact that, oh, the lights are going down, in the fact that we have, uh, we'll have an hour conversation, talk about some of the film, show some of the clips of her body of work, and then we'll open it up to you. So um, I'll make sure that I'll have cues so that I don't hug you the whole hour and a half, uh, and then we can open it up to all of you. So we're gonna dive right in. Um, read that your first exposure to uh, film, film screenings uh, was in high school or at a young age. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that experience and the exposure you had to the arts and, and film culture at a young age. Okay, uh, I was senior in high school and I was um, a member of a film workshop at the Studio Museum uh, in Harlem. Um, and that was when they st I first started seeing um, foreign films. Um, prior to that, I was just a television watcher and going to the movies to see whatever was, you know, trendy and what have you. And being a part of that film workshop, um, of course, changed my life. Because from that point on, I started uh, making films, studying films, and um, thinking in film. And uh, the first film, the foreign film that I ever saw was uh, a really rough one for me at the time. It was uh, black and white, silent, uh, with subtitles. It was uh, Eisenstein's Potemkin. And it was a wonderful movie, and the rest, it just, the rest is history, you know. So you started watching a lot of international film titles, or was there also American independent cinema? Well, it was at the time, uh, in the late 60s, it was mostly 16 millimeter uh, foreign films that were being screened at the uh, Studio Museum. Uh, French films, uh, um, the Italian uh, neorealistic films, um, Indian films, uh, Japanese films, you know, by Ozu, and everything was subtitled and everything was totally um, foreign to me. And uh, I guess it was about that time that I realized that I preferred foreign films to American films, to, uh, and of course, I preferred it to television because it was something, the unknown was very, very um, challenging, and it was very um, engaging, and I felt like I had been, it was magical to, to be able to see a film, and then the lights come on, and it felt like I traveled somewhere. Because I grew up in New York City in the Queensbridge housing projects, and it was a very low income, and it wasn't like we took vacations or anything like yeah. that. So going to the movies and seeing a foreign film actually became how I took my vacations. So your first film was an animation, if I'm. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's, these are these are students. They're interested in, uh, okay. in the first films that some of their legends uh, create, especially when they're horrible. animations about a pimp. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. It was an animated film that I made about a pimp. Um, that my, uh, you know, I, my family helped me make it. I kept waking my mother up in the middle to help hold the lights, you know, and I learned after that, you know, the lights have to be rock steady, otherwise you have this blinking effect on your animation. But it was, um, you know, I was shooting, you know, like one, two frames, time lapse, pixelation, and um, it was about a pimp, yeah. It's just so interesting to me that your, your kind of, your world opens up through international, you know, art house film and yet your first film is a is a animation with, well, it with was your an mother assignment. we had to do a time lapse I after well after the Studio Museum of Harlem then I went to the City College of New York and I majored in film uh, so I have an undergraduate degree in film as well and that was one of my assignments was to do a pixelation um, uh, uh, kill step frame one one frame you know animation so I decided to, since there were so many images of pimps around at the time, <laughs> I was able to cut out that image of a pimp and put him on a, you know, pipe cleaner and, you know, have him walking around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned that uh, when you're in school, your first assignment is, is, um, is animation. So then that kind of, you enter now into this world. A lot of the students here talk to us and ask us about different film schools and different film programs. And, 
what it really means other than, well, I'd prefer to live in New York or Montreal or Toronto, mm -hmm. but there's more of a difference than that. Um, could you talk a little bit through your own experience of you know, what it was like in New York mm -hmm. and then in, uh, in LA? Okay, there weren't a whole lot of film schools. A lot of there weren't a lot of choices when I was going to school in the um, late 60s, early 70s. Film was not trendy. It was not competitive. No one was fighting to become a filmmaker. I mean, if anything, it was being a photojournalist. That's what was really cool, if to have all these Nikon cameras around your neck, you know, kind of like the... Um, like the character in Apocalypse Now running around, you know, with all the cameras. That's what was cool. Filmmaking, it was just not cool <laughs> at all. It was not even on the charts. So they taught, there was a filmmaking course at um, City College. It was a pilot program. It was experimental. And there was, of course, a filmmaking course at NYU, which I could not afford to, to go to NYU at the time. And then other than that, there was, there was really nothing uh, in New York. So I, that was one of the reasons I went to um, Los Angeles to go to UCLA and to the American Film Institute before, prior to UCLA. Um, in New York, uh, the focus of film instruction was on newsreel and documentary filmmaking at that time. Uh, I had a few great teachers from um, Boston, uh, filmmakers from Boston, and they were the ones who had us doing the um, step frame uh, animation. And also they would give us like a, a reel of clear leader and we would have to draw our film on it. <laughs> you know, if you could even imagine that. It was, it was great fun, we thought they were crazy, but they were hippies, and <laughs> and they were about you know expand your mind, and we did, and um, it was you know <laughs> it takes a lot to draw a film because just you imagine 24 frames a second, so 24 frames is like of drawing doesn't amount to much. So we were there quite a long time drawing our films. Um, they would also um, they were about. Ex ex pushing us to expand in the way we thought and in the way we um, visualize film. And I'm really glad that uh, I had those teachers because they would do things like they would just um, create a fishbowl and, and inside the fishbowl they'd put just words like the, uh, the, red, the color red or the word for scale and then we would all put our hands in, pull, it, pull out the piece of paper and we'd read it and each of us would have to make a film about that, a one minute film about whatever it was. And so you go like, okay. But it's a, it's, it's a wonderful exercise and I still use it with my students because it, um, it makes you think on your feet and, and it pushes you over the edge often. And, um, and I like that. And that's the way it, the real world is when you're working uh, and you're not trying to do you're not trying to copy someone else's work or, some, or another genre or something. When you really want to create on your feet, you have to um, you have to come bring your best game. You have to come prepared, and to come prepared, you have to train yourself to prepare in such a way. Um, you mentioned in a, a Sight and Sounds uh, interview, in I think in the in the '90s, there's a quote here that I love, and I wanted to talk to you about this. Uh, I stopped making documentaries after discovering Toni Morrison, Todi K. Bambara, and Alice Walker. I wondered, why can't we see movies like this? I realized I needed to learn how to make narrative movies. Uh, can you expand on, on this, how, how you saw a representation in literature that you did not see on film, mm -hmm. and how that shifted you from documentary and from your experience in New York yeah. so, to LA? Okay, so this would be in the early 70s. And of course, you know, in our literature classes, we were reading Toni Morrison and Toni Cade Bambara and all of these wonderful writers. And I'm um, Sula, the bluest eye. Um, and I'm, I'm in your mind's eye, you're just envisioning all these wonderful stories that have to do with African-American women, African-American communities. 
but we we didn't have that opportunity to see that on television or in in movies you know so they did have black exploitation movies at the time but just like when we watch them now and you just laugh and howl and kick up your leg and go oh my god that's ridiculous that's what we were doing then too so I wanted to try to learn how to do narrative, to tell a narrative story. I didn't even know how to write a screenplay. I didn't know where to begin. And so, AFI. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, what was really interesting when I was reading up about, um, I didn't realize that it was a film scholar that, term, that coined the term LA Rebellion. Yeah, that came from uh, Professor Clyde, Clyde Taylor. Taylor. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so a lot of the students here between um, the resurgence of um, the film restoration project in LA, the Getty exhibition, all of the um, interviews that you've been doing that keep mentioning this phrase, the LA rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, could you, you know, talk a little bit about what it means to, you know, what that term means to you? Okay. And, um, <laughs> and you know, what your experience was like working with, uh, with your colleagues in LA. Okay, I just have to say, when um, Professor Clyde Taylor first mentioned um, that he was going to be doing a lecture at the Whitney, and he was calling the lecture the LA Rebellion, and it, he was gonna be curating a series of our films, and this was like about 25 years ago. Even then, I know, we all burst out laughing. <laughs> because the L.A. Rebellion sounds, I, I told him it reminded me of, uh, I kept seeing some image of someone with a torch at Harper's Ferry, you know, like saying, Let, let's tear down, <laughs> you know, here we go, we're going to take this bridge, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so it just seems so over the top dramatic, <laughs> you know, yeah. but in an old fashioned way, <laughs> you know, it's like you don't have real guns, you just have pitchforks, you know, yeah. <laughs> and that's what, so, um, <laughs> but uh, I've come to appreciate it now, the term, um, because I understand what he meant. It's more of a metaphor than someone running with the pitchfork and the, and the, and the, and the fire. Um, <laughs> the, we were a group of filmmakers who just really happened to be at UCLA or in the, the LA vicinity, working as independents, working together in a very collaborative way. And we were, of course, the product of our times. And the times were, we had all, I guess, come out of the, there were riots in the mid 60s in Harlem for me, and there were riots in Los Angeles um, in the late 60s. And so we were all politicized. Uh, and very aware that with our little cameras, we're able to give voice to situations and um, even our fantasies uh, and, the, and the books we've, we've read and all of the things that w were not available to us. It was just like the, the Wild Wild West was open. You know, just I guess it was the way, I felt the same way when the internet opened up you know, and was it was just suddenly there. It was like you could do anything that you want. You could you could express yourself. And prior to that, the expression was uh, limited. Uh, prior to the um, being together at UCLA, where you I actually had people who were there who could help me uh, make the films that I wanted to make. Because of course, you know, filmmaking. Uh, is cumbersome and it's not something that you could do alone, but you could do now with digital filmmaking, you could do many of things by yourself. But back then, uh, I don't even know if you guys would knew this, but the sound person was tethered to the camera. Did you know that? By a cable? So when you're running around, you know, you have your sound person with the Nagra, you're connected, and then you needed lights galore and all kinds of things, it was not a one-man show. And so that nurtured a kind of collective... You, you needed help. You needed help to do that. It was like a performance piece just to make a film, you know. Yeah. So now it, it's different. It's a whole lot different, and it's uh, in many ways better, of course. You know. uh, 
so we should we I'd love to start with uh, one of our clips that we have from Illusions, but bef before I will kind of set it up, set in Hollywood in 1942, mm -hmm. it, uh, it tells the story of um, a studio executive passing as white, mm -hmm. and this specific clip uh, shows a um, African-American performer who is dubbing for a white movie star. Okay. Now, this film is a seminal part of film history. You had all kinds of critics and cultural scholar and cultural thinkers and scholars um, writing about this. Now, before we talk about what other people said about it, mm -hmm. you know, positively, what did you? What? Why did you make the film? Like, what was your goal? Well, um, I actually got the idea to write this one when I was at AFI. And of course, at AFI, they told me, well, this is insane. This is ridiculous. Number one, you can't sync a film uh, post-production. OK, that was in the 70s. That, that was before rock and roll singing. This is so like way before you. So they got technical with me and said, well, it's just not doable. It's not possible. I said, I know it's not possible now, but that doesn't mean there's not one uh, sound guy somewhere who could say, let me see if I could wiggle around this sound and, see it and do it in a post sync situation. Um, that was analog before digital. Um, so I couldn't make it there. Uh, and then I got into uh, UCLA, and at UCLA they had sound stages. So that helped a lot because I was able to build the set there. And they also had all of these um, post-production sound rooms that I could use as sets for this, uh, and I think that's the clip that you're gonna see that I have uh, the young lady singing. Um, um, and I have to laugh because I'm, la I'm thinking of the set. It's, so, it's hilarious. When it, when it showed up, I'm like, is that it? <laughs> you know, it's like, but anyway, we'll talk about that afterwards. But <laughs> can we, sh can we show the clip from Illusions, please? Oh, okay. Oh. So... Um, Lana McKee is an African-American woman passing for white, working for the Hollywood studio, and of course Esther Jeter is the, um, the singer. And she recognizes right away that Lana, uh, the character Mignon, is African-American, but no one else in the audience knows that. When I first saw this film, I, you know, I'd seen films like Singing in the Rain that had the dubbing mm -hmm. of the actress, or as you see, you know, 1940s propaganda film, but all of the kind of themes and behind the scenes mm -hmm. of um, Hollywood at the time exploded in my brain once I saw this film and started thinking about the lack of African-American representation, the idea of kind of workers never getting credit, and then the idea of also in another scene later on in the film about the role and the power of film right. in the industry. And also the tap dances, they were, there are they were legends or myths that there were tap dancers, black tap dancers who embellished the sound for Fred Astaire, you know, with the tap and Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, you know, the fast tapping and stuff. So was, was it your film school background, your knowledge of film history, of African American history, you know, how did, you know, it seems like a culmination of everything on the screen in a That's, really powerful way. Can you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, it was uh, it was all of that. It was um, um, being a fan of old movies, watching old movies on television, and and seeing, knowing that um, the the Hollywood star was not singing; that it was the voice of Ella Fitzgerald, um, who would never have the opportunity, and never did have the opportunity to ever, you know, like be in a film like that. But her voice was used. Uh, musicians were able to play but n never be on uh, camera because they didn't want to offend the southern states during the time you know so uh, so it was it was a it was my protest mm -hmm. uh, against all that by subverting the Hollywood um, uh, storytelling genre by using their genre, and even we even attempted to make it sound like a film from the 1940s, but I think we went overboard, it's a little, little crackly. Um, uh, the, by giving it that old sound, shooting in black and white, very high contrast, um, just you know, creating a B movie, but a B movie 
that make that makes the audience squirm because it's like, wait a minute, this this doesn't normally happen in this type of film. So, yeah, it was fun. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the you received a lot of there was a lot of scholarship, a lot of reviews about the film. A lot of the students in in this room are currently experiencing, you know, critique with their colleagues and their classmates and their professors, and they put their heart and soul in a film, and then everyone watches it and has an opinion. Right. What did your peers think of the film when it came out? Well, when you um, first screened it? I kind of got hit from both sides. Um, the reason being is, um, they, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the Douglas Sirk film, uh, Imitation of Life, and, and there's another one um, called Pinky, and it's about um, um, these young black women who are very light skinned and passing for white and very ashamed of their, um, their heritage. So since this was a very politically charged time when this film was made, um, there are a lot of people, and including my fellow uh, filmmakers, who didn't understand what I was mm -hmm. doing. Even some of the ones who worked on the film, they thought I was making, duplicating that, or imitating that, or mimicking it, making a film about uh, a light-skinned uh, black woman who was ashamed of being black. Because prior to this film, there's the you know you have the whole tragic mulatto that Donald Bogle talks about in Tom's Coons Mulattoes and Bucks. Every time a light-skinned African American appeared anywhere in any kind of story, it was about them being ashamed of who they were. Now, of course, you know being African American, knowing many light, everyone light skin is not a mulatto, and they're certainly not tragic. You know, I, I know very, I don't think I know any tragic mulattoes, but that's the, that's a Hollywood trope. Hollywood loves to, to show, oh yes, if only she could have just, you know, been a little bit wider, then she wouldn't have been so tragic. But it's, so of course, uh, it was interesting to me to want to do something about that to kind of change that um, whole notion of passing for white because you're, you're sad or depressed or, or you don't feel good about yourself. In fact, I have, uh, I had an aunt, she passed away, who was very light skinned and doing the, uh, World War II, she told me that she would go downtown in New York and, and get her hair done and buy a salad at the Waldorf Astoria, sit there and eat it, and then come back home to Harlem. She was passing for white because it amused her. It wasn't because she was sad or anything. It was just, well, let's see how far she could get with it, you know? And, uh, uh, so hearing stories like that made me, you know, encouraged me to want to try to see, well, let's, let's, let's take a look at this tragical mulatto character and just show that she's a woman of independent means and she's just, she's just, you know, doing her thing. Yeah. <laughs> so sweet, yeah. Thank you. I think it's really important for the student, you know, it's it, another film that we're going to talk about now is uh, Daughters of the Dust. And, you know, it's so celebrated now, um, and it was celebrated at the time, but it was a real struggle to get it made, and it's important for the students to not just hear, you know, lauded oh, yeah. accolades. Oh, I mean, yeah, this is like whenever, 20, you know. 30 years later, everyone says, oh, we love it, love it, love it. Uh, both of these films, uh, at the time that they came out, people were like, okay. Um, because even... Um, even among my contemporaries, if you're doing something different, if you dare to step out of the mole or step out of lockstep, people are not, <laughs> you know, sometimes they're not so kind mm -hmm. because it's, um, it, they don't quite know what to say. And I see that is, that's something, it's not just me, it's, it, it's with every day I, I see that, you know. Um, with my students sometimes, you know, they want to make a film that they think will please, not themselves for us, what, that will please uh, the me as a professor or, or will please their friends, or they think it's gonna help them get a Hollywood job. And it's just like, I'm always telling them, hello, that's not how jobs are gotten. In Hollywood, you better know someone 
inside uh, because jobs are gotten through prior um, relationships more than anything else. Or if you win a film festival and you get recognition, you know, all of a sudden everyone's all over you. But uh, you can't really make a film set out. That should not be your intention. You can't set out to try to please someone or try to fit in. You should be trying to make the best film that you can. And that's that's great. The um, Daughters of the Dust is about three generations of um, of women off the Sea Islands in South South Carolina in 1902, like early 1900s. And the film is mapping some of the family is moving north, mm -hmm. and some of them are staying back, mm -hmm. and um, in the homeland. And um, they, uh, it's often referenced as this landmark film um, because it was uh, because of the, your ability to get it distributed, oh, because yeah. of your ability to rock the theaters and <laughs> make a lot of money and yeah, keep, turns keep out the theatrical that, run. Yeah, it turns out that I guess because I love foreign film so much and I was determined to do uh, an African-American film that was so deeply authentic to the culture that it turns out to be a foreign film within, oh. in, within my own country. Uh, it's foreign because it was like, you know, distributors say, well, this, it, you know, it came out the year of juice and all the, the, when all the urban testosterone films were coming out and I came out with this. And they're like, well, <laughs> <laughs> what in the world are you doing? Here? Which is funny because then it, it it's taught in universities and colleges and in Canada, it's taught as an American independent film. Yeah, <laughs> so it's also it? funny how the labels and the categories, you know, yeah. it's an African American film, it's an independent film, but it's yeah. also, it's, it's you know, in Canada, it's American film. It's oh, an American okay. independent. In, in American, it was thought of as, as foreign. That's, yeah, exactly. Um, so I, um, I have so many questions about this film, but I think maybe we should start with uh, the clip that we're about to see, which is um, the family. Me some of the family members are about to embark um, on this journey to go north, mm -hmm. and uh, before then they will have some uh, photographs taken, okay. and they'll, they're going to sit with uh, their nana, who is, who is staying on the island. So if we could show the clip of Daughters of the Dust. Such a beautiful film. Just uh, in this scene alone, we see a lot of actors, actresses yeah. that you've you've worked with on a number of your films. Uh, right, and almost every actor, almost every actor from um, the L.A. Rebellion, is also in this film. There's Casey Moore, who's Hagar. There's uh, Coralie Day, who's Nana Pazant. There's uh, Alva Rogers who was in School Days, and uh, Barbara O, oh, who was in Hailey's Bush Mama and, and Larry Clark's film. Uh, and of course, Casey was in Charles Burnett's film as well as um, Larry Clark's film. Uh, Trula Hoosier, who was in Charles Lane's Sidewalk Stories out of New York, but that's not the LA Rebellion, but she's yeah. still an independent film independent. actor, you know. So. Um, uh, and of course, uh, Mr. Sneed, the photographer, is from uh, She's Gotta Have It. Spike Lee, She's Gotta Have It. Can you talk about your how you the process of casting, and um, you know, not just for this film, but your your projects in general, how you think about casting? Well, um, for this one, I really wanted to cast people who had worked independent films, uh, who had come along over the years and 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 worked with us. Uh, because it was, this was the first time I was gonna be able to pay people. Uh, we had $800,000 to make the film, and I wanted to, I didn't wanna just go out into the, you know, cast other actors. I wanted to be, finally be able to pay back some of the actors who had worked with us over the years. Like Barbara for Diary of Nathan Yes, Men. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one of the things with this scene that's always so striking is it's, the entire film beautifully staged, beautifully shot. Can you talk about um, the role of tableau and photography? You see kind of magazine catalogs. You see a lot of, you're playing a lot with um, fluid and static. Can you talk a little bit? About yeah, that? I wanted to uh, create um, 
these tableaus that looked like um, portraits um, from the past, from the photography, of course, James Van der Zee, P.L. Polk. Um, I can't even remember the, <laughs> the other ones now, but I was thinking of, of having these tableaus to burn inside the memory so people would remember the film, if, if not anything else, by the look. Um, it's almost like turning the pages of a family's um, um, photo album. Yeah. So um, you then had an, adap not an adaptation, but six years later, you then wrote a novel that continues the story of the Pizant fam family right. 20 it years was, later. Yeah, it was a continuing story because this is a migration story. Then 20 years later, we have the uh, Harlem Renaissance. And so I put those characters who did, those who traveled north, uh, I created a story around them, what happens to them in Harlem, and of course, and kind of wove in a little Zora Neale Hurston stuff. Uh, had one of my characters be an anthropologist from Brooklyn College who goes back down to the islands to try to understand her family who come from these Gullah Geechis and speak so strangely and, and, and do wonderful things. <laughs> I think I'm just getting the sign that I need to pick up a little bit because I'm like oh. loving all of this. Um, the next project that we have a clip for is uh, the Subway Stories short that you made. Okay, that's a film um, that was produced by uh, Jonathan Demi and Rosie Perez and it was an HBO anthology and they gathered together all of these directors and writers from who were uh, born and raised in New York City to do Subway Stories and they had a competition and people sent in letters about amazing things that they saw in the subways or things that happened to them and I chose a story about a saxophone player and a canter. And, and what did you end up calling it? Uh, it's called Sax Canter Rift and I also added a singer. So let's watch a clip from there. Okay, so that's, um, I don't know how many of you remember early cell phone service when you, we couldn't get cell phone service in the subways. That's how this story kind of evolved. This girl gets down there and her phone's not working, so she has to use a public phone. She's c trying to call her mother who's, she's trying to get to the hospital because her mother's dying and she, uh, she can't get any service and she realizes that She's not going to make it in time, so she just starts singing her mother's favorite song, and while her mother and her mother dies while she's on the phone, um, I identified. I chose this story to do because I identify with the three rowdy girls who came. Uh, you know, the you know, opening of it when they come running down the steps, they are messing with people, you know, bothering people, messing with the concession stands, doing all this stuff, and then all of a sudden they get caught up watching. Who, uh, this woman singing on the phone and they think she's crazy at first because, you know, why she, you know. But uh, I grew up in New York City and even as a child, you know, you go to school via the subways, you come, everything happens in the subways and there's so many different things and I don't know if that's, it's like that here or not, but, you know, like the noodle guy says, <laughs> you know, guy sitting there eating noodles in the, <laughs> in the subway, even though he comes down, and he says, oh, it smells like urine here, but he's still eating and eating. It's, you know, it's a, it's a culture that uh, many people in Los Angeles don't understand, the subways, because we don't really have it there like that now. Not as many interesting things happen in your car. In the right. <laughs> right. Um, you mentioned last night, and this really uh, struck me, you mentioned this idea of uh, resonance in your filmmaking. And you also pointed out, and I think it's important for the st students to note too, all the different types of films and all the different styles you have um, experimented with. Mm -hmm. And you know, there is a common thread of strong African-American women and characters. Um, but stylistically, you still see a Julie Dash sensibility. Can you, can you talk a little bit, I keep using that phrase, talk a little bit, but can you, I uh, explain or or tell us what you meant yesterday, uh, or what you what you think about it resonating, filmmakers resonating on film, what that means. Hmm. Um, it's so much easier when someone's telling me what I meant, <laughs> and um, oh. for me to, to say because with each one it's different. But I I do realize that when I 
am working that there is uh, a lot of people don't quite understand what I'm doing. And for instance, if we could go back to that one, uh, a lot of the crew people were teasing me about the flowers and the wind blowing, because of course you have to bring a wind machine down and all of these things, and I'm blowing flowers. I wanted them to blow across the tracks. I wanted them to blow into the faces of the girls. Uh, and Those are pretty heavy flowers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what happened... <laughs> Was that that train you saw go by behind her? That was a runaway train. Uh, that was not supposed to happen. And everyone's calling for me to cut the scene, and I wouldn't cut the scene. And and you know I'm getting all these cues that it's not going. The, the, and the mixer is sweating because you know she's singing live, and you cannot do that to a track. But I let it go. Uh, but because of the runaway train, our next shot was supposed to be in the tracks. The crew was supposed to get down in the tracks. That was immediately cut off because of the runaway train. So then I couldn't do my flower scene right. And I couldn't do the flowers and the scarves blowing into the women's faces. So they hooked it up to like, um, uh, what do you, um, a fishing rod mm -hmm. with micro and they were pulling the flowers and blowing them and then it was just and the whole crew was laughing because it was just like it was just a comedy scene so <laughs> I guess I'm saying all that to say it's very hard to explain to uh, people what you're trying to do yeah. but I was trying to create this magical kind of thing that was happening from this woman's song and the convergence of the song the sac of saxophone player and the cantor who was coming down the steps and uh, the mixer did a wonderful job of melding the, the, putting the sounds together yeah. the voices and it, it it was really quite kind of beautiful a thing that happened and it's very common in the, in the subways for these wonderful things to happen inexplicable things but to explain that to a film crew, they just like whatever, whatever. Just, yeah. just tell me, can't when can we go to lunch? Basically, yeah. you're like, so yeah. you're telling me that because you want this magical part, I have to bring a wind machine yeah, down and the stairs. Like, and so, yes, yeah. And so it's <laughs> it it gets a little difficult at times because they don't really, they have to do it, but they really don't want to do it. They're not enthused about it, and they definitely no one was getting in that track after that runaway train, <laughs> you know. So. So it goes back to what you yeah. were talking about, about really being passionate about what you're doing. Because if you're motivated mm -hmm. just by some imaginary payoff in Hollywood or whatever else right. that is, yeah. you are not going to be able but to persuade people to... Exactly. And, and you really have to stay focused and stay on track with what you want to do because everyone around you is not with you necessarily. And it's, you know, it's nothing personal. It's just that they don't understand it because it's not the way they would have envisioned the way that things would would roll out or take place. So you mentioned also, you know, with keeping with what you're passionate about and and the kind making the kinds of projects that working on the kinds of projects you want to um that you seem to also make connections along the way like Jonathan Demi, Rosie Perez and then Angela Bassett came calling yeah. for a project in 2002. Mhm. Mm the Rosa Parks story. Yeah. So, so I guess it, it comes from the, I didn't know her before and I didn't know Rosie Perez or Jonathan Demi before, but they kind of know your work, you know, your work gets seen and they say, well, we want to work with you in doing this or that and the other. Um, so um, once again, you know, just stick with what you're doing, focus on what you're doing and let people come to you and, and they will, you know. And so this, the it's um, I, be, I believe a CBS TV film. Oh, CBS Television Network movie, yeah. Mm -hmm. The 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 Rosa Parks story. The Rosa Parks story, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we've had a drilling, uh, grueling schedule for you. Uh, in two thousand and two, and it stars. Uh, do you, can you maybe? Uh, Rosa talk? Parks, uh, Cecily Tyson, um, and Peter Francis James, yeah, mm. and so, uh, Dexter King. Yeah, yeah. it's so. This scene, this film is a docu. It's it's uh, termed as a, a, a biopic. Yeah, a biopic, biopic yeah. and um, uses a lot of archival research as well as um, script writing, and, and it seems to be a yeah. theme. The There's script a lot is of written by Paris Qualis, you know, wonderful writer. Yeah. So the scene that we are going to see is Rosa Parks and her mother sitting on a couch and. Talking oh, as, about as during the Montgomery bus boycott, and she's doubting um, 
uh, her actions. She's wondering if maybe she made a mistake by not getting up off the bus and causing such a fuss because the uh, the bus boycott went on for almost a year. Queen. And the house is all boarded up because people are threatening them in everyone's lives. She's been fired. Her husband has been fired from his job. Uh, the Klan is, um, is surrounding the house every night, threatening them. And so they're living in fear and poverty and, and anxiety. So the boycott was successful, and we no longer have to ride on the back of the bus. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Rosa Parks. Um, a lot of your projects you are writing, producing, directing. What's it like, or how is it different when you're brought onto a project and there's a scriptwriter and and someone is, you know, like Angela Bassett's calling you. What happens is um, being a DGA director, Directors Guild of America, you're usually the last writer. The director is usually, does a polish mm -hmm. of what's written. But there was wonderful stuff to work with. Paris Qualis is a tremendous writer. And um, he got a little pissed with me a little bit because I changed some things around the locations and things like that. Instead of playing that particular scene outside, I put it inside of the house that they were living in. It was all boarded up where they were being, you know, every night, you know, the Klan would come and break their windows and all that and things like that. So you have to negotiate um, with, with the writer as well to kind of do the final polish on, on a story. But... Um, I think you would agree now that it, it works there better than played elsewhere. Which is a different type of negotiation from, you know, the subway stories or Daughters of the Dust when you're convincing people, but you're also more, you know, mm -hmm. explaining to them your vision. Yes. And this is, you need buy-in yeah. in a different kind of way. Yeah. So, so you're constantly negotiating and, and collaborating with, uh, with the people, you know, from the time that I was in the L.A. Rebellion to working on a, a, a Hollywood movie. It's a constant collaboration and negotiation, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, you had, um, or I mentioned that you are teaching at Wayne State mm -hmm. and, um, and that you've taught at a bunch of different schools. And one of the things that it kind of brought full circle for me when I was thinking about it is how from the very beginning of your career, you, uh, you know, students are often told to meld theory into practice. They're often, you know, but you really, you worked closely with, um, you know, you were inspired by and then, and then worked closely with scholars. I know that scholars in this room have written extensively on you and are very influenced by your filmmaking and, and your body of work. How did, you know, how did, how did that relationship, that strong relationship between, you know, you, you started reading, mm -hmm. um, but then you had, you know, in the, in the making of, you have Todi K. Bambara and Bell Hooks in it. Mm -hmm. You have um, scholars working, and now you're, you've worked at, you know, really research-based right. institutions, Stanford, Harvard, Yale. Well, I, I've, I've, along with my love for foreign films, I've always been fascinated by films, of course, having gone to film school, films that have, that we talk about the resonance, that have multiple layers of meaning and, and, and possible readings and images and using uh, visual metaphors uh, that you pull from sociology, anthropology, all of these different types of scholarly um, works. Um, also, uh, you know, having studied Hitchcock and of Austin Wells, you know, just the very basic, you know, just um, you, we would, when we were in film school, we would have to put these 16 millimeter films on a film block, which they don't have anymore. So it's like putting, having your film streaming on a computer where you stop and you look at it and you study frame by frame to examine and to analyze and to see what the director is, is, is telling you. And uh, when you do that, you realize, oh my God, there's, there's layers and layers of stuff in here. Just like Hitchcock used to play with, um, uh, with everyone. I mean, you know, he would uh, constantly move background pictures around and it wasn't that he was not being, you know, using continuity. He used to do that to mess with your mind. 
And it was like, oh, okay, I could do that too. You know, so that's how the layering begins. There are messages in movies. And so you mm. use film screenings and do you do, you know, have show well, screenings and then analyze the scenes and then have production classes that mimic certain practices or? Uh, no, uh, I don't generally teach that, it's, but it's something that I do. Um, because I usually don't have that much time with students and it takes like years and years and years to talk about the layering and I don't want to confuse people with, uh, I don't want to tell someone to do something that may not be in continuity, you know, because we have to work in such broad strokes. Well, I do when, when I'm teaching, but when I'm designing a film, um, I sit with my production designer and my uh, cinematographer and we work out ways to communicate um, uh, visually, uh, for instance, with uh, the Rosa Parks story, I created a composition, composed my scenes where there was, you always have some kind of, of, of gate or obstruction in the foreground of the image because she was constantly going up against forces that were larger than, you know, and herself. So uh, I always have some kind of foreground opposition going on there, or at least we pass through it in the movement of the shot. Uh, so things like that. Right. Yeah. You mentioned your own projects. You have a new one that, well, you have multiple projects in, in various stages, but you have one that you mentioned. Right, that's Tupelo 77 um, that we'll be shooting this summer, and it's a wonderful project. And it's actually a Canadian project. Angel Entertainment is uh, the production company. It's out of uh, Saskatchewan, and it, but it's an American story. And it was written by a writer in New York, uh, Rich Mancuso. And it's about uh, a group of women. Um, uh, two are white, uh, two are black, and uh, one's um, a transsexual. And they work in a restaurant uh, 70, uh, like miles outside of Tupelo, 77 miles outside of Tupelo. And you've worked, this isn't the first time you've worked in, in Canada because you were mentioning um, earlier this morning that you were editing the Rosa Parks story during 9-11. When, uh, the morning of 9-11, yes, I was here uh, when it happened. Um, and I've also shot um, car commercials here because for some reason you have wonderful roads or something out in the countryside that are really twisting. And car We're known for our twisty roads. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. So the <laughs> the car companies they like to shoot um, car commercials here. Well, I noticed too. You also had like a Steve Harvey, yeah, commercial, and you've done a bunch of commercials. It was really interesting. You should uh, look at her YouTube channel mm -hmm. and all of and all of the work that you have. And thinking of another platform, right? You have mm -hmm. you had the festivals and theatrical distribution, and you are. Um, always shown in the classroom mm -hmm. and uh, muse in now museums and, and other institutions and, and now online right. everywhere. Museum film, which is kind of like my, not Western, but it was the first time I got to work with horses and on a river for the uh, Underground Railroad Freedom Center Museum. I did a music, um, a movie for them, yeah. And you have a website or online project that you're working on? It's like Cypher? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that's a... Uh, that is a, an original story that I've written called Cypher. It's about uh, a, com a computer encryption specialist, a young lady who has a PhD from like MIT. And so that's something that I've been wanting to make for a long, long time. You have a lot of projects on mm -hmm. the go. Uh, I think now we'll open it up to the audience, start asking them, or start fielding some of their questions. You could oh, raise so the lights just a little this bit whole more. Area over here. I'm sorry, I've been <laughs> turning away from you. <laughs> it's hard to see. Does, mm -hmm. are there any? Uh, yep. Yeah, there's one right here. If we could just get the mic. Oh, we'll 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 go to the front after. Yep. Thank you so much for your films. They look wonderful. Thank I was you. just wondering where Sea Island was shot. The Sea Islands are. Uh, we shot on about seven different islands. Uh, off the coast of uh, South Carolina and Georgia, and um, they're you know they they're not far out into the sea, but they are called sea islands, and they're like Ladies Island, Hunting Island, Edisto, 
uh, Sapelo, um, Data, Johns Island, um, um, they also call barrier islands. I, I don't want you to get the impression that they're, um, they're so far away from the mainland. They're very close, but around the turn of the century, they didn't have bridges. So these little barrier islands, um, for generations, the descendants of slaves who were on those islands, they didn't have any real contact with the mainland, which would be South Carolina or Georgia. So that's why um, the West African retention there is so strong because they were, and it was also an area where there was so much yellow fever that uh, most whites did not live on the islands at that time. But of course, you know, the West African um, Slaves that came had, um, a lot of them had sickle cells, so they didn't suffer as much from the malaria. So they were on these islands and they were isolated for many, many years. Okay. And that's what makes the Gullah Geechee culture so different from the culture, Af from African Americans, from perhaps Alabama or Mississippi or something like that. Hi. Um, I don't know why I remember this, but um, I just I wonder if you could speak to um, the reception of Daughters of the Dust. And I don't know why I remember this. It was 20 years ago. But for some, there's the impact of the film, the resonance of the film, across communities of interest. Mm -hmm. And just as an aside, I can remember young black women going down to the, the islands because they saw your film. Yeah, there's yeah. been a whole resurgence yeah. of, <laughs> of, of yeah, tourism yeah. in the area, and they have the uh, Gullah Geechee Tours, sure. yeah. and they have um, a lot of wonderful things have happened um, since the film has come out, and including, you know, people like myself being very proud to say, yes, I'm a descendant of a Gullah Geechee, whereas like bro, when I was growing up or a teenager, if someone would say, are you a descendant of a Gullah Geechee, you'd go like, well, my father, yeah, kind of, you know, it was, uh, uh, the, to be called a Geechee when I was growing up was like being called the N-word. Okay? Yeah. So, it is something, it's changed. Indeed. And it's changed for the good. <laughs> but there's also that, but there's also, um, you changed up the discourse. That film changed up the discourse. And, and I don't, as I said, I don't know why I remember this, but the village voice debate and the charge against your film mm -hmm. was that it wasn't authentic yeah. and that the Laura Ashley Oh, clothing. that was the Daily Variety um, review that said it looked like a Laura uh, looked like a Laura Ashley commercial. That's right, and mm -hmm. and that was a re I mean it was really the burden of representation mm -hmm. that you had to be authentic, you had to be documentary realism, and you mm -hmm. changed it up. That film really yeah. changed it up. Yeah, I Thank think um, I, we talked last night about reframing and redefining um, uh, how we see, uh, how I saw myself as an African American. Um, and people were so convinced that, you know, they had seen Roots, they had seen Gone with the Wind, and they had seen uh, Sounder. And that's all they knew of, um, you know, African American history. And if it wasn't that, you know, it, it's like, w if you were talking about African Americans in a historical piece, we were either picking cotton part of, or, or, or in an urban uh, situation. And there was nothing in between. So when they saw my film, it was just like, well, how could this be real? How could they have on a white dress? Why aren't they in the field? Well, this was, you know, post-slavery, but still the association with historical drama, African Americans, slave. And so people had to get over that. <laughs> and it took like 20 years for some people to say, oh, well, there were other things that happened, <laughs> you know? There's a question over here. Okay. Not much of a question, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, because the the movie, The Rosa Parks Story, really, um, that to this day, that's still mine and my grandmother's favorite movie. Oh, and we Because we watched it back in 2002, when I was mm -hmm. 10 at the time. So. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember we were sitting there and we cried and we cried and we were like, you know, because um, we're native and going 
looking at that kind of gave us like kind of the inspiration to do more stuff in our community because we you know they always like shafted us too and made us feel like you know that we weren't a part of society sometimes mm -hmm. and you know we could I, we could really relate to the movie and we just we just wanted to say thanks <laughs> well thank you for telling me that Uh, first of all, I just want to say I love your boots, but uh, my question is, what sort of advice do you have to aspiring filmmakers, such as a lot of us here? Well, I think uh, the best advice is be true to yourself, make the films that you want to see, that, that, that please you. You have to please yourself first. Uh, you can't say, well, the audience, you know, the traditional thing, the audience, they want to see a horror movie, so I have to go find something horrible to make a horror movie about. You know, it's like, that's like going at it all wrong. Uh, if you eventually do want to make a horror movie, then make the best horror movie that you could imagine. But you can't try to second guess or uh, what is going to be trending and, and trying to fill in um, and find your place within that trend because by the time you finish it, it'll be another trend. Who knew? You know, it's always who knew. So you just have to be true to yourself. And even if people are telling you why you're making something that just might be the most bizarre thing in, in the world, uh, just go ahead and make it anyway, especially now when you're young and you can get away with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? So uh, I guess that, that's pretty much that what you should do. Yeah. There's one right there. Thank you very much again for coming for the second day in a row. Um, I had a question, especially when you're talking a lot about um, Daughters of the Dust mm -hmm. and also the subway story and your crew members not necessarily understanding what it is that you're trying to do. And my question they is... They were guys too, so it's a gender <laughs> thing. It's a, it really... It really <laughs> so I wanted to know, um, and I guess this would apply to a lot of films, but particularly for trying to create a new kind of genre where you're not seeing black people in the same stories, roots, et cetera, et cetera. What references do you use and how do you explain to the people who are working on your film something that actually doesn't exist historically yet? Mm -hmm. Well, what I usually do is uh, I create a whole Bible for them, for the actors and for the crew who are interested in reading it. Uh, and sometimes it's this thick, and then we go over it and discuss it. And of course, with, with my keys, you know, with a cinematographer and, and production designer and all of that, you work with tear sheets. And now, what I encourage my students to use is Pinterest, the online um, imaging thing where you have tear sheets. Uh, I insist they don't understand me, but I insist they all have Pinterest boards. And I'm constantly checking them, and I say they will be graded, not on the content of their boards, but by how much they participate. Because you, I can't really see how anyone can work without having these reference sheets or tear sheets from magazines, from, uh, from whatever, around you at all times to continually point to visual references of what you're talking about, even if you're just discussing the color blue, there are like a hundred different shades and hues. You all have to be on the same page about the, the color blue. I have a, a question about mentorship and, and mentoring. A lot, of, um, a lot of students will talk to us about if there are mentorship opportunities. And on the one hand, I want to be pointing them to any kind of formal internships or other kind of placements. But another time, there's really powerful things that can happen in, in people's careers where they informally or it starts off as a working relationship. Become, they, they develop mentors and advisors in, in life as well as work. Do, do, you, do you have any or did you have any guiding forces or any, any support system? It also can be colleagues, right? But do, do you feel like you had a mentor or oh, the, the L.A. Rebellion, the people who were members of the L.A., like Charles Burnett and Larry Clark and Ben Caldwell and Barbara uh, McCullough. Um, just knowing that you could just pick up the phone or go over someone's house and, and lay your sheets out or and describe what you're doing. And even if they tell you you're crazy, you still have someone to bounce these ideas off of. And it's, and it's a wonderful thing. It's better than working alone. And with mentoring young people, uh, I usually do have like interns on the, the set. I know we burn through a lot of, 
<laughs> in terms on the Rosa Parks story because people don't really understand the hours that you put in. That I mean, they really don't understand. Um, one day we worked almost 24 hours a day on Rosa Parks and the next day none of the student interns showed up again. Because, it, it, you know, like when you're just getting rolling at three in the morning and then you have to turn and you go and you wrap at, you know, like eight or nine in the morning, mm -hmm. they don't fully understand what that feels like. And then you have to force yourself to sleep in the day because your day starts, you have to sleep and then wake up and your day starts again at four in the afternoon. That's, that's the true test. So you should... You should try, if you can, to intern on a few productions so you can really get to know if that's what you want to do. Because some people are lulled into believing it's this, the film festival and then talking after, and it's not. Making a film is like doing construction work. It's really like be, we're doing construction work at all strange hours. And it's, it's not, it can, be, it can be not pleasant. <laughs> uh, but you should know before you, before you get out there for real if, if that's what you want to do. Because it is very rewarding, but it's not necessarily fun when you're um, on the set. So we have a question. Um, yep, and then there's two. Hi. Um, I was wondering, I noticed that a lot of your stories seem very, uh, or sorry, a lot of your films seem very story-driven and very passionate. Now, what connection do you get with your DP to tell that story, not just through words, but through the visual side of the film? Well, like I said, the, the collaboration is always very strong between myself and, and the DPs. And I've worked with a number of DPs, all very good. Um, that's the first person that's hired um, after I come on board. I bring a DP and we start laying it out. And like I said, with the tear sheets and the pay. Uh, papers, and then we start looking at a series of films, and we usually find ourselves looking at foreign films, uh, because it's kind of the best way to explain something to someone is to show them what you're talking about, and uh, it's uh, and we and you're constantly revising and um, and reworking things. And there's another thing that I do. I also, you know, those little, in the toy store, those bags of um, little green soldiers. I use that to put my little soldiers up. They're my characters. And then I, and I show my DP exactly what I'm talking about. You know, like they'll have a rooster and a, and a chicken and then a little green soldier. I say, if the chicken is the camera and then the chicken goes around like this, this is what I'm talking about. Because you have to, phys you have to show them, you know, and I, I don't draw well, so that's how I do it. It's... it's I, it couldn't be more important. You have to know, you have to make the film before you get out on the field. The film is made in the production office, I always say. You really do have to make the film in your mind, in the minds of the DP and the production designer. It's already made. You just go out there and follow through on your designs because the DP, they have, they have their book made with all their lights, how the lighting setup is going to go. And you have your in your mind your designs what how it's going to happen. It's not like you just step out there and look around and say, "Hmm, I wonder where I'll put the camera today." No, <laughs> no, it's it's all pretty much worked out. But you have to also be flexible. You have to be open to chance if something happens and something kept happening on um, Daughters of the Dust, like, you know, there would have be weather coming in over the ocean, a squall or something, and something would happen and it was just, and you'd have to take advantage of it. You'd have to, you have to be confident enough to say, I'm gonna stop this and take advantage of this even though it's not on the slate, it's not on the production sheet. It's really interesting that you're also talking about all of this research for the DP because you're first starting in a lot of your films with so many archival um, research projects mm -hmm. 
And, you know, with Daughters of the Dust, like five major rewrites and how to translate the dialogue. Oh, rewrites and uh, you rewrite every day. Re yeah. Read your, yeah. Rewrites and nothing. You will continue. You just be rewriting all the time. And then finding yeah. a way to translate it with the DP. So there is someone that's been patiently waiting for with the microphone somewhere. Okay, whoever it is. Hi. Um, just going back to um, communicating your vision to your uh, DP, would you say that storyboard, storyboards work well as well? Or do you work with storyboards? Storyboards work well, um, for especially for like action sequences or very complicated sequences. But... You could get locked into your storyboard. You could, if you're not the artist yourself, your artist is seeing something else and they will be drawing it the way they see it. And that's why I like to work with the little men and the chickens because that is, the, it, that is something I could touch and move and, and change. And once you get on set, on your location, storyboards don't necessarily work. You may not be able to lay track where you want it to lay it for whatever reason. Um, they may not be enough room. You thought that you had more, even though you measure and everything is done, you get there on the set and, and your actors may need more freedom. So if you're locked into a storyboard, you, sometimes it gets a little awkward, but if you're locked into exactly how you know the the movement of the actor and the and the camera is going to be I think it's a little bit more flexible, so storyboards are are good but yeah you know, <laughs> storyboards can be a problem. <laughs> so we have time for one more question. Yep. Uh, so as you're speaking in terms of your career as a director, I was just curious as to what are some of the reoccurring obstacles or one of your greatest challenges throughout your your career as a director uh, that you could think of and maybe shed light on? It's always communication and, 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 and gender obstacles, you know, like we talked about with the flowers. If I'm like trying to get something that uh, someone might think is too girly, uh, something is like, an, it's insignificant because it's like, oh, there she goes again. Oh, you know, uh, there was one cinematographer who kept, uh, he didn't like foreground stuff that I like to do. Um, so it's, it's just a communication and trying to uh, work past, um, work past w what I want, you know, what someone else wants me to want, and I have to convince them that no, I know exactly what I want. No, it, it doesn't get easier. It gets easier if you work with the same DP and they be, know you and they trust you, but each time there's a new DP, it's almost like there's a new learning cur curve, you know? Okay, so I said, oh, okay, one more. It's hard to turn down <laughs> students. Th thank you for being here. Um, I, I was just uh, curious, you spoke a lot about uh, making a film in the 70s compared to making a film nowadays, and uh, I'm just curious as to your thoughts on the, uh, the technological advances in making a film and the ability to convey these amazing stories uh, now, uh, then compared to now? Mm -hmm. Well, it is, it is totally different because, you know, uh, we, when you're doing what we call the chemical filmmaking uh, and working with film stocks and celluloid, that was totally different than it is working with um, um, a digital. Uh, but you know what's interesting? Uh, people who are shooting HD, we're starting to go back to warning a negative for safety. Because all that in the ether stuff could really be in the ether. And you, it's, it's really scary. The whole digital asset management is serious business. You could shoot something and a whole day's worth of work can be somewhere. But I love shooting digital, I love working. <laughs> but, um, but, but just know that once the project is completed, it may be still a good idea to go to a negative. So you could actually say, there it is on the shelf, not just, you know, on a disc or whatever, or in the ether. And, and because platforms keep changing every six months, and projects that I have that were on D2, 
Have any of you ever worked with D2 or even heard of D2? No, it's analog, <laughs> you know? And that was like one inch. Mag tape above that, oh yeah, right, okay? So <laughs> things just keep changing, so, but if you have a negative, a negative is still a negative. But I wouldn't suggest shooting on film. That just, unless, you know, just for art's sake, just, to, just for fun. But um, it might be a good idea to finish, you know, put your finished project on a negative so you at least know where it is. You could touch it. I'm so sorry we have to end the session today. It was so incredible to be able to sit and talk with you. And thank you to everyone else. And please thank you. Thank you. Julie Dash. Thank all of you. <laughs> it was great. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you.